So, let's all yell together as if we were at a football game. How many types of grace are there? Two. Sanctifying grace and actual grace. What's the difference between these graces? Sanctifying grace is what lives in the heart. There is no way to earn sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is a gift. Gift from God. We cannot earn it. It's free gift. What does sanctifying grace act upon what does it act upon sanctifying grace acts upon our soul so even though your body dies someday as father mark was talking about this morning's mass everybody has a date of course so in his case it was predestiny but Maybe, maybe not. But we all have some end, which we don't know necessarily. And the end of life, as we know it for everybody, people are like, well, when's the end of the earth coming? When's the end of time? And Jesus' response was, don't know. Basically, it's not revealed. It's known only to the Father. Not even the Son has a clue. So those parts of God that are busy doing what they do are going to be doing it all the way up to the last moment of time. When God the Father says, okay, it's a wrap. So, you can turn on your TV in a, in a morning like today and you can probably catch local stations, not cable. Well, the cable will carry local stations. But if you carry local stations early on in the morning... You'll run into all kinds of preachers up here in North Alabama on the TV. And they're spreading that sermon of good news. If you've been saved, if you ain't been saved, come on down and we'll save you. No. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But the answer is no. Who is the only person that can save you? Jesus, yes, the second person. God in the person of Jesus is our Savior. It is only through Jesus that we can be saved. There is nothing we can do. There is nothing we can say. There's nothing like, well, I received Holy Communion 27 times today. No action that we take can save us. Now, does that mean that we should just go on life and be mean and rotten and nasty and be in it for ourselves because only Jesus can save us? No. Because Jesus also can condemn you. And as uh, one of our previous associate pastors had said one day, we were having a dinner down here in the hall. He said, you know, there's three things in judgment. You got two chances to go to hell and only one chance to be saved. And it was like, what? I thought, like, if you're bad, you go to hell, and if you're good, you don't. No. There's those that die, and when they face Jesus, and they will all face Jesus, and he starts to go through the list of things that they've done that are wrong, what they do is they go, they don't care. They don't care. They have no sorrow for it. Those are the people that we traditionally think of have been condemned to hell. But there's another group. It's like the Adam and Eve. What about these things that you've done? Well, uh, yeah, well uh, Lord, now, I wanted to do the right thing, but I, they, they made me. I, 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 it wasn't my fault. So when you fail to acknowledge your own sinfulness, that's your second chance to go to hell. 
and your opportunity to go to heaven is when you see Jesus and he lays out your sins. You acknowledge them and beg forgiveness. Those who are truly sorry, truly sorry, not just say it, but truly sorry, are the ones that Jesus will say, welcome my good and faithful servant. But he just like people that go to war, if you're in the military, you go to war and you kill what's known as the enemy. The church says, no, no, God doesn't hold that against you. Because you're fighting for a greater cause, typically a cause of freedom, so that people can enjoy the things that God has given us, not become slaves to another person. Anyway, I hope that answers your question. All right. So, sanctifying grace acts upon the soul, stays in the soul. I don't know if your little notebook has anything in it that says that or not. No. I don't see it. Anyway. So this is where you have something to scribble with and you scribble it down. Sanctifying grace stays in the soul. It is what we call habitual. That means it's always there. But habitual means that that's where it lays. It stays in the soul. It resides there. It doesn't move. Sanctifying grace stays in the soul. It is habitual. Now, it's what makes the soul holy. It gives the soul supernatural life. More proper, it is supernatural life. So, sanctifying grace is supernatural life. Supernatural. That means it isn't mortal. It's at a level we don't see, smell, hear, taste, feel. None of our senses. We can't hear it, but it's in us. This gift of life comes through the sacraments. Now remember, the sacraments are not something like, oh, well, we go to communion and there's a, lo a little wafer there, and then, you know, back when we could have a sip of wine, that's great. No, 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 no. No. That little wafer has been changed into the body of Christ. And that wine is no longer wine, it's the blood of Christ. But it looks like wine, it tastes like wine, yes, to our mortal selves, to our natural selves. But when we go supernatural, it is the body and blood of Jesus. He took 12 men into a room on Holy Thursday. And there they celebrated the Passover. And it's believed that they, uh, the Passover has four parts where you basically have wine and you sip the wine. They only did three. And when Jesus was on the cross just before he died, his last words were, it is done. And it's believed that when he spoke those words, he, with his blood, was fulfilling that fourth cup of wine. So if you ever participate in what's called a Seder meal, that basically is the, what we do with Christian, is we celebrate the Last Supper, doing the same things that the Jews would have done when they celebrated the Passover meal.
Okay, this gift of life comes through the sacraments. I said that. It begins with baptism, which incorporates it into the life of God. We cut ourselves off from this life. How? What cuts us off from this supernatural life that God has given us? What kind of sin? Mortal. There are two basic types of sin. What are they? Mortal and venial. Mortal sin is removed when you go to confession and share that guilt that you may have with another person, namely the priest or bishop or whomever is in there. But it has to be at least a priest. And when you have told your sins, confess them to another human being, that human being has been given the power through the ages to forgive those sins. Jesus gave that power to the apostles. And they, in turn, when life was coming to an end, gave it to others, to bishops, who gave it to presbyters, which is a Greek word for priest. But they didn't give it to deacons. So our deacons don't have that. Bishops, priests, and higher up. They could forgive your sins. And when your sins are forgiven, God restores the sanctifying grace to your soul. So if you die and you have mortal sin, we say there's no hope for you. There's no sanctifying grace in your soul. You have damaged it. What about venial sin? It's sin, but it is not deadly sin. Venial sin does not remove sanctifying grace. It does not remove sanctifying grace. But what it does do was, what was that big word that started with a C that was, is it still there? No, it's cleared. That was up there last week that we wrote down. Con, concubescence, yes. Concubescence. And we define that as an attraction that we have to sin. It's like, oh, uh, yeah, that's pretty good, you know, I think I'll sin. So it's our tendency to want to sin. It's a, it's a, it's a mortal, I mean, it's right here, it's a human thing. It's a human quality. Adam and Eve went out, and the first thing they had to do right after God said, don't is do. You have a little brother and sister that's, you know, in a three to four year old range, and you tell them, stay out of the cookies. Uh, where's the first thing they do? As soon as nobody's around. Into the cookie jar. We have a tendency to want to just push the envelope, do what shouldn't be. We don't not take time to go, hey, is this right? Is this okay? Oh, it's fun. So concupiscence is something that says we have an attraction to sin. Mortal sin kills the soul in essence. It removes the sanctifying grace. Venial sin, the problem with venial sin is it does not kill the soul, the, the sanctifying grace. But what it does do is leaves us open to greater sin. That we just go, well, that well, was all right, you know, and then I'll just do that. And eventually it's a bad thing. It's like doing drugs. You just start it because, oh, you know, you're curious. Next thing you know, you are hooked. You're in a sad, sad state. Your entire being needs more drugs. If you have a job, all your money goes to more drugs. When it becomes obvious, you don't have a job. You don't have food. You just want drugs. You've been enslaved to that. And it started oh so innocently. I'll just try it one time. Nope. It's a whole lot like people that used to smoke. They'd get started 
usually they get started and you know the first time when they're 14 or 15 years old in high school and they take a puff of a cigarette and the next thing you know is they're coughing and yakking and turning green and all kinds of colors and it's really funny but by the time they're 18 they're smoking like a fiend they've gotten used to it not good so mortal sin can become habitual in terms of things that we do and as a result mortal sin removes the sanctifying grace from our soul it basically is a slap in the face to God only God can restore his life to us through the sacrament of reconciliation so who can fix it not the priest God the priest is the vehicle that God uses, the human being that hears us speak our sins. But we have to be truly sorry for what we've done. God knows. And when he knows that you're truly sorry, then sanctifying grace is restored. So you could tell the priest all you want. You could sit and laugh after, boy, I fooled him. Didn't fool God. So you have that immortal part of you known as your soul. And it's there. Even though you can't find it, you know, if they do a body scan or whatever, you can't find it. It's there. And it lives on beyond you. Your body will die. But your soul will live on. And it has choices as to where it'll live. It could be rewarded and live in heaven. Or it can be condemned and live in hell. But it's going to live. God sustains this life through what? There's a sacrament that is used to sustain sanctifying grace. Which sacrament do you think that that would be? Something that sustains you. What? Reconciliation? No, that's the one that restores life in the soul. Which one sustains sanctifying grace? No, not confirmation. What sustains you in life when you want to, you're hungry? What do you do? Food! What does Jesus offer us for food? Yeah, through the sacrament of Eucharist, Holy Communion. So Holy Communion keeps us, sustains sanctifying grace in our soul. It should be more than a mere, we went up, we got a host, we ate it, and we went and sat down. That's not receiving Holy Communion. Understanding that when the priest is there with the deacon or without the deacon, and he has the two things held up, through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever, that is what we need to subscribe to. It shouldn't just be something that we wait and then we all go blah, 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 blah. No. It should be that that's the moment that our hearts waken up to the fact that this is Jesus' body and blood. And he's about to share it with me. And if I'm in the right state of mind and existence, sanctifying grace will be increased to whatever level I need. God knows what I need. He'll provide it. It's a gift. Little kids get little gifts. They don't get big. Well, they may have physically big gifts, but they're not complicated. Older children like yourselves. Oh, I want a phone. I want this. I want that. Oh, it's more complicated. And you may get it. Because you know how to treat it. A kid, little one, they just step on it, throw it out, lose it, whatever. So when God provides us with grace, he knows what we need, and he provides what we need. All right, what's the difference now? We have actual grace. What is actual grace? And I think you said it best. Yeah, the reason, uh, why you use it's energy. Yeah, it's a shot in the dark. I mean, not a shot in the dark, shot in the butt. It's like, oh, yeah, I need some energy. I need some enthusiasm. I need whatever I need. God provides that through actual grace. It is temporary. It's not permanent. 
It's not like, hey, I got myself some more uh, actual grace here yesterday. No, no. It's there for when you need it, typically to do something. And the next time you need to do something, you'll have more actual grace. But it doesn't last. That's the key. So we use the word here. Actual grace. Write this down. Actual grace is transient. Sign in, please. We got two chairs up here at the front that are empty. And they're side by side. So, actual grace is transient. Up here in the front. And you know how to spell transient? T-R-A-N-S-I-E-N-T. -E transient. What does transient mean? Yes. No. No. What does transient mean? When, if I said, oh, hey, you guys are here at St. William, but in an hour and a half, you're going to be at home. What did you do? You traveled. You were transient. You were in a car, in the way, going on the way. Transient means movement. So, actual grace is not permanent. It's transient. It's a shot in the arm. It helps us go. We need help. The more we become focused on Jesus and the more we become focused on the Trinity and what is the will of God for me, the easier it is to secure actual grace. Because once I am surrendering myself to the will of God, He will provide me with all the energy I need to do all that He wants me to do. Whatever it is that I need to get it done. This is when I sit back afterwards and I go, how did I do that? I don't know. I don't know. It was an infusion of actual grace by the Holy Spirit. Actual grace. Oh, I'm sorry. The other word is we called uh, sanctifying grace habitual. Actual grace is, <coughs> excuse me, not habitual. Not habitual. It stays with us only for as long as we need it. It is not habitual. Actual grace is what we pray for to help us make right choices in our moral life. All right, let's go to session seven. Are there any questions about the grace? The two types and how they get there, how they act? Notice the two sacraments that were involved predominantly. Baptism, that's the beginning, and the Eucharist. And what is the fixer? Reconciliation. Confirmation is a strengthening of the gifts of the Spirit. We got them when we were babies, but we didn't know any better. All right. Here's things on angels. Fact or fiction. So you can take a choice. We'll ask which ones believe it's fact, which one believes it's fiction. Angels are like pixie, pixies, elves, or leprechauns. It's fun to imagine that they exist, but adults know they're not real. Fact or fiction? How many say it's fiction? How many say it's fact? 
What do the rest of you say? You only got two choices, so let's try it again. How many of you think that angels are like pixies or little things that children think that they're there, but adults go, they're not real? How many think that that's true? How many think that that's false? Good. It's false. God created the spiritual, non-corporeal, meaning bodily, bodiless beings that we call angels. The church bases this teaching on both scripture and tradition. Each angel has intelligence and will, just like us. And each is a personal and immortal creature. Immortal. In other words, each heavenly angel is a unique being, just like we are, who has chosen to love and serve God, its creator. It is a being who will never die. Question. All angels are wonderful and help us humans. Or all angels are wonderful and will help us humans. True or false? How many say true? How many say false? What's another term for fallen angels? Demons. demons. Exactly. So demons are fallen angels and they are not good for us. It's like, uh, no, 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 no. When humans, especially young children, die and go to heaven, they become angels. That when you die, and particularly little kids, if they die at an early age, they go to heaven and they become an angel. How many think that's true? How many think it's false? So what do you think about that? <laughs> no. What do we become? Any human, little child, big person, old person, what what do we become when we die? Just a soul. Ah, uh, no. Our mortal, I mean our immortal self, our soul, what does it become? It starts with an S. It's the name of a team in uh, New Orleans. Saints. We join the saints. Now, well, I'm going to have another saint. I mean, I'm going to have a Sunday or something in my name. No, not necessarily. No, but we become saints. Now, there are what's called canonized saints, which means the church has seen what they've done in their lives and hold them as good examples for others. So they canonize them. Canon means order. So they place these saints in the order. And as we go through the year, we have, in some cases, multiple years, we have a, a feast day for these saints, each one of these canonized saints. But for the rest of us, we do attain sainthood. We may not be recognized here on earth by a large majority of people. We may not be canonized, but we're saints. So, angels are angels. Angels were created by God. Angels are spirits. They've never had flesh. And when you die, you're not going to become, oh, I don't have flesh anymore. No, no, your flesh will rejoin your spirit. That's what it says. The dead will be raised. So, what do we become? We become saints. So, we have three, three categories. We have... Saints that were there. We have saints that are here today walking the earth. And we have saints for the future. 
And what do we call this, where we have these three groups together? What? There's a word. And we learned it two years ago. No, not sainthood. I'll give you a hint. And I was like, I was asleep then. Really. Communion of what? Communion of saints. So the communion of saints are those saints that have been, are now, and will be. Will be. Yeah, remember, you know, we're trapped in time, but God ain't. He created it. He can skip and jump anywhere he wants to. So this is called the communion of saints. I believe it's part of a creed. Communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, and life everlasting. Amen. Don't we say that? Uh, I think we do. So that's what we join. We'll skip this one because this is almost like a... Uh, what it says is that every human male gets a male guardian angel to help him on earth. Every human female gets a female. Well, here's the good news. Angels don't have sex gender. So we're not getting a male or a female angel. We do get guardian angels. But... Everybody has a guardian angel. There is no difference between male and female. <clears throat> oh, you mean saints? And the people that have gone to hell? Uh, I guess just a lost soul. Yeah, condemned, damned. So they don't they don't they don't rate I mean it's not something that you want to work toward. You know, you think some people are really working hard to go to hell, but really most of us don't want to. They're not part of the community. I had a, a friend who had been an army chaplain. And we were discussing, this was in another parish where I was teaching um, PSR there. And he'd said, you know, I didn't think it was true, but he had an experience. He was there in a combat zone and guys were being killed and wounded. And he says, he had several of them tell them that Father, I've never believed in God, but I need to be saved. Can you help me? Now, here's an example of someone who's lived a life that we would think, you're going to hell. You said that there's no God. You've advocated that to everybody you know. And now suddenly, as you're risking death, and you may well die, you're announcing God Help me. Those were the three words he says that came out of their mouths. God help me. And if it was sincere, God does. And that's where we go, what? It's up to him, it ain't up to us. We could sit back and go, I think he's wrong. I think he ought to go to jail. I think, you know, this is our human nature. But in God's case, now nah, he knows better, and he judges fairly. The Catholic practice of praying to angels or saints borders on worshiping false gods. True or false? That when we pray to an angel like St. Michael or pray to any of the saints, 
we're actually praying to false gods. True or false? How many say true? How many say false? Excellent. Remember that. I'm serious. The reason I remember it is because as an adult, a lot of times you run into people and they think that that's what it is. You Catholics, you pray to statues. You pray to saints. You pray. I pray to God. You guys are heathens. You're out there. You're just going to hell. Well, we're not praying to God. We're not worshiping these people. We had a word that said worship. Who was assigned to that term worship? God in three persons, period. Then we had a term that we wrote down in the sixth grade, which was dulia, D-U-L-E-A. And the first level was hyperdulia. Who was in that hyperdulia category? Mary. And then there was dulia. And who was in the dulia category? Saints, angels, every, everything else. And what it basically said was, worship we reserve for God, period. That's it. In three persons. Hyperdulia is our reverence where we look to Mary and we hold her as a bright example, the brightest example of a disciple. So yes, we have prayers that we ask Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Well, those words are right out of the Hail Mary. And then the announcement of the angel Gabriel when he appeared to Mary for the incarnation. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Those are the words that her cousin Elizabeth spoke when Mary went to visit. Jesus. That's out of the Jesus prayer that was added several centuries after the Hail Mary first was started. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us. What in the world are we asking Mary to do? Pray for us. We're not asking her to give us forgiveness. We're not asking anyone to pray for us. I could look at any of you and go, hey, I've got an operation coming up tomorrow. Do me a favor. Pray for me that it's successful. Now, am I worshiping you? No, I'm asking for your help. And that's exactly what we're doing when we talk to praying and we use Mary. And if we're doing that for Mary, guess what we're doing for all the angels and saints? The same thing. We're asking for their help. We, we are not worshiping. All right, here we go with the uh, cheat sheet. What does the word angel mean? What's the word angel mean? Messenger of God. It's right there on your sheet. Now I'll ask it again, see if we can't get a little better and louder response. What does angel mean? Good. Good. Angels are messengers of God. And it's a two-way communication. Okay? They're here for our benefit. God puts them here to benefit us. But at the same time, they have to report to God. What's going on? How are you doing? Does he need help? They are messengers of God. They bring us good news from God and they take back what our needs may be. Now we have nine choirs of angels. Some places have fewer but the Catholic Church recognizes nine choirs. 
Yes, and when you count them, it's there. We know about the seraphim and the cherubim because that's part of mass. What about the thrones? They're in the scripture. The thrones are there, and what their job is to surround the chair of God, the Father. And Jesus sitting at his side. So they surround the throne of God, which is why they're called thrones. Dominions. Virtues. Now these are all words that come out of Scripture, which is why they're titled that, because they're identified in Scripture. Virtues, powers, principalities. These we may not know, but they're part of the Mass, typically. If we use the, what's called the long version, you'll hear them. Then we have archangels. How many of these other angels are there? One, two, six. How many seraphim, cherubim, thrones, dominions, virtues, powers, principalities? How many are there? A lot? Uh, yeah, you could probably say that. How about archangels? How many? Four? Okay, there are some, some faiths will say that there are six. However, the church recognizes what May said, which was how many? Three. Yeah, we don't. Well, Lucifer's the lead person out of the fallen angels. So we have Michael, the archangel. And he don't appear until the end of the Bible. I mean, he's in there. We have Gabriel. What did Gabriel do? Yes. And who's the other one? Who's the other archangel? No, we already said Gabriel. You got to go down a few steps. Who are the three named archangels in the Bible? <laughs> Raphael. We have Gabriel, we have Michael, and we have Raphael. These are the three named archangels that are in the Bible. And then what's the last choir of angels called? The last. No. Guardian angels. Exactly. Guardian angels. How many angels are there? We don't know. Other than three, uh, three uh, archangels that we recognize. We know that everyone has, an arch has a guardian angel, but that doesn't mean that that's all the guardian angels there are. I don't know. Church doesn't even guess. All we do know is what Jesus said to Pontius Pilate about his followers. When Pilate says, I have the power to do this. And Jesus basically says, if I wanted, my father would send and would wipe out the Roman legion that was there. When we speak of St. Michael the Archangel, we normally depict St. Michael with a flaming sword. And the reason is we'd say with St. Michael is that he, we identify him as the defender of the faith. So that at the end time, St. Michael will be there defending the faithful and defending the faith. No, there was just a guard, or an angel assigned there. It wasn't identified as Michael. We don't know. We do know that it was a, an angel with a flaming sword. 
but that doesn't mean that Michael's the only flaming sword. How many of you have ever heard of the Knights of Columbus? Okay, yesterday there was a uh, ceremony here. Well, actually over in the Foley Center. But at Mass time, Father Mark came in and had an honor guard of knights with swords. The swords are not there. They're ceremonial. And what they're ceremonial for is in honor of St. Michael, the defender of the faith. So while St. Michael is spirit, the knights are flesh. And if you ever go looking for things, you'll find that the Knights of Columbus have this little book that you can read or write or order or whatever. And they're all about the faith. It's about living our faith. And the sword is there to represent St. Michael as defender of the faith. At one time they used to have capes. And the capes were significant of the cloak that Jesus was adorned with when they started to mock him as a king. Okay, the question was, do we become angels when we die? No. What defines the nature of uh, angels? Well, that's easy. They're pure spirit. And they have intellect and free will. What do we have? And free will. But we're not pure spirit, are we? No, we're mortal. We're created out of dirt. Now, I wouldn't go around and tell anybody that oh, you're just dirt. Even though it's true, they might take offense at that. And then you can become a statistic as they shoot you because they, he said I was dirt. But in reality, we are. We're all dirt. So when we run around and judging each other, you know, oh, I'm not going to deal with them. You know, blah, blah, blah. The fact is, we're all the same. We're all dirt. So don't get excited about something. If somebody insults you, don't worry about it. They're dirt. It's a fact. Angels are spirit. They're not dirt. Now, we have a soul that is spirit. It's not dirt. So at some point, when God takes away that breath of life from our bodies, our bodies revert to dirt. However, our souls, being spiritual, go on and are subjected to the judgment. In which case, then we can become a saint or not. Which angel appeared to Mary in the Annunciation? Gabriel. Gabriel. Which angel will appear at the end of time to conquer Satan? Michael. Where do demons come from? They're the fallen angels. It says now here what it says is a third of the angels or the, the third of the angels that rebelled against God in heaven and were cast out are called fallen angels or demons. So where do they come from? They come from that third of fallen angels that followed Lucifer. What about the other part? Only the, the other two thirds? Yeah. They're, they're the ones that are split up into the nine choirs, well, eight choirs, the archangels are already taken. Okay, then the question is, who's the fallen angel that led to rebellion in heaven against God and the faithful angels of the Lord? Lucifer or Satan. Does every human being have a guardian angel assigned to them by God? Yes. Should we name our guardian angel? No. They're not toys. They're not good buddies. That's right. No. They are above us in the order of creation. Remember, it was God, 
angels. Man. Yeah, down to dirt. So we don't, <laughs> in some respects, they are. So no angels are above us in the order of creation. We do not have authority to name them. So don't. That'd be like sitting there saying, hey, I want you to meet my guardian angel. I don't see anything. Yeah, well, it's Bob. Bob, why don't you say hello? We don't do that. We don't do that. Now, remember, we can ask angels for help. So I can say, my guardian angel, I need help. <coughs> I need your help. Can you please pass this along? And you can converse with your guardian angel. That's why they're there. Are they real? Well, I don't know. I, I mean, you know, they're spirit. But can they become mortal? No. But can they appear in this life? Maybe. And why do we say maybe? Well, we do know that some guardian, I mean, angels have appeared. Right? We know that. Gabriel appeared to Mary. We know that other angels, when Jesus was out there in what's called the Transfiguration, when he was out there with Moses and uh, Elijah, that angels came and ministered. When he was in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, angels came and ministered. Now, he was flesh, so they appeared. So yes, angels can appear. Even though their life, their being is spiritual, they can appear. Apparently, they have that power. And the story that always gets to me is that one that was in Tuscaloosa here, what, five years back, ten years, whatever it was, when the big tornado outbreak killed 300 and some odd people in Alabama. You may have been too young to remember it much. Then again, maybe you're not that young. But Tuscaloosa was sorely hit. The tornado went through Tuscaloosa and killed a lot of people. I have a daughter and son-in-law that were at the hospital in Tuscaloosa. And I forget, they were visiting someone there. And they were all ushered into interior rooms. And when they came out of the interior rooms, glass, the outer glass windows had been blown in. So if they'd been in those, uh, in those hallways, they'd have been cut to shreds. But more to the point, a firefighter found this ice, ice, you know, uh, ice cooler. And there was a noise from it. And he's like, what the world? And he opened it up. And there's a little boy in there. No. He was just in there hiding. The firefighter asks him, he goes, what are you doing in there? And he said, the man told me to get in here. And the firefighter says, what man? And he says, the man in white. There was no white. There was no body, I mean, white person standing around there. So what is it believed? That his guardian, that little boy's guardian angel appeared to him, told him to what to do, and he did it. Yeah, get in the box, and he did it. I got a really question for you. What's that? So, you know how every, like, in Gabriel, when Gabriel shows up to Mary, he says, do not be afraid? That kind of stokes the point. What do you think angels look like? Because sometimes they look like babies, and sometimes they're just eyes with, like, wings. Oh, I know they have them depicted with wings and stuff like that, and that's man's curiosity. I mean, we do. that goes back to when they were first doing angels. What I mean, the church, I don't think, has any particular, oh, this is what you look for, because typically you're not going to see them. So why are you looking for something that you can't see? What would you wear if you weren't here? No, I mean, not here, period, on the planet. Yeah, what would you, if, if May were here on this planet, what would she wear? But she's not on this planet, she doesn't exist, but what would she so the bottom line is we can't, we, we don't have a, what would she look like or what, we don't know. We have no idea. 
Those are just renderings. You know, oh, we'll have angels with the big glorious wings behind them. Did what? No, she saw a person. Just like you and me appearing. When we celebrate Our Lady of Guadalupe, it was that the Blessed Mary appeared to Juan Diego. She did not have wings, but she did appear. So like she was there in the flesh, but then she would disappear. But what she wore, well, that's what uh, that's what the bishop got. What, what was she wearing? Because he didn't believe him. I mean, after all, Juan Diego was nobody special. He was a farmer. But I want you to think hard of all the times where we see in any uh, any after the Bible, after the Bible, where we have these appearances where God or Jesus appeared to someone or Mary appeared. Who are they appearing to? How many of them appeared to a pope? Exactly. How many appeared to a cardinal? How many appeared to a bishop? How many appeared to a priest? They haven't. So all these apparitions, or what we call appearances, have been to people or children. In Portugal, Mary appeared to three children. Three. All these apparitions or appearances that take place are done to regular people. So, you guys, particularly the ones that want to blah, 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 are important. Why? You have no idea why. But you can carry on with life with your, I don't know. Now, here's the bad thing. God won't punish me for things that I don't know. Does God save people on uh, South Pacific Islands that have never been exposed to God? Can they get to heaven? Yes. yes. Why? Because the decision to save is based off it's God's desire. It's, his, it's up to Him. But they weren't this and they weren't that and they weren't there. That's our judgment. He alone judges. What happens if I die and he starts going, why didn't you this or that or the other? And I go, well, I didn't know. I, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know. You know what his response is? Tough. Tough love. Exactly. You should have learned. You had the opportunity and you wasted it. So waste your opportunity. It'll show up again. Who's another person that took advantage of an opportunity? What was the story that we did last week? Was it Abraham? And he had a son named Isaac. What happened to Isaac? He didn't get sacrificed, did he? He was about to, but God said what? Don't do it. All right, what happened to Isaac after God said, don't? He got let go. All right, so Abraham had 
two sons. Actually, more than that, but we'll just let it go at two. The two primary ones. The two important ones. One he had because Sarah was too old. How old was Sarah? Sarah was 90. How many ladies do you know that are 90 that are running around pregnant? Uh, yeah, none that I know of. Yet, Sarah became pregnant. But, before Sarah became pregnant, Abraham had been told you're going to have a son and he's going to, your, your descendants will be more than the stars in the sky. And Abraham's like, oh, okay. He believes. Sarah's like, oh, you nuts. I'm 90 years old. And then she had the brilliant idea. Oh, I have my handmaid over here, my helper. Why don't you make her pregnant? She's young. She could bear a child. And he did. What was her name? What was her name? No, but close. You're close in the alphabet. Started with an H. I, what? H A G A R. Hager. Or some pronounce it Hagar, but we'll just call her Hagar. That was, and she had a son. Who knows the name of the son that Hagar bore for Abraham? He is the uh, father, I guess is a term that you can use, patriarch of the Muslim world. No, not Muhammad. Muhammad was born and it was a general. What? Ishmael. I-S-M-A-E-L. Ishmael, son of Hagar and Abraham. However, they weren't talking about Hagar. They were talking about Sarah. And bingo. He has visitors and one of them says, I'll come through here in another year. I'll be on my way. And uh, you'll have a son by then. And he's like, yeah, yeah sure. Okay. <laughs> I'm over 100. <laughs> She's 90. <laughs> and that's how Isaac came to be. She did become pregnant. And that was Abraham's son. So now you have a son and another son, but one they are stepbrothers. Okay. But the one born to Abraham's wife is the one that received his inheritance. That was Isaac. Isaac was the one that God said, sacrifice him to me. And then he stopped it. So Isaac went on to have a nice long life. And Isaac had two sons. What were their names? I forgot their names. Like, it's Isaac's son. It's Isaac's son. I totally forgot their So Isaac has two sons. First off, who did Isaac's, uh, who did Isaac go with for a wife? He traveled over. Think hard, you Wednesday night participants. He traveled over, had ten camels, and this uh, girl came out to uh, water the camels, and her name was what? All you guys that were there watching the little children make little camel bags, you know, puppets. What was her name exactly? Drub it. What? What kind of name was Robert? Rebecca. Yes. Rebecca. 
So, all together now, let's say, who's the wife of Isaac? Rebecca. We'll try it again a little louder. Who's the, who's the wife of Isaac? Rebecca. Very good, Rebecca. Don't forget it. Why should you never forget it? Because at some point in your life, and you sit down with little children, you can tell them these stories out of the Bible, and they listen intently. And even though that they are very young, of a tender age, they remember. I oftentimes, I drag my grandkids up here. It's not my oldest grandson, our permanent Walder server. I mean, he's on the list all the time. I don't know why, but. <laughs> That's okay. I keep telling them they want him to become a priest, which is why they have him on the altar all that. Well, you look good on TV. They don't broadcast the 8.30 mass. <laughs> Only the 5.30 one. So anyway, you might relate these stories to them. And his younger sister is the one that we get in the car and we start going home. She starts telling me all these things and I'm like, wow. Wow. She listens and she learns. And you can be the one bringing that good news to the child. What do you think God does for someone like that? Does he ignore you? No. He does indeed. If it's coming out of your heart, not, not through, oh, I want to get to heaven, so I'm going to do this. No, 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 no. No, you just do it because the need is there and you fill the need. That's a good source for sanctifying grace. And in order to do a really good job of it, you get loaded up with actual grace. And when it's over, you sit back and you say to yourself, how did I do that? And you may not know, but you did. And that's all that matters. So, Isaac took a wife, and that wife gave birth to two boys. They were twins. Does anyone know the first, the oldest? I mean, he was just minutes ahead of the youngest, but who the oldest, what the oldest name was? It does start with an E. I have a trick that I remember. Esau. Esau was the older of the two, and Jacob was the younger. Esau then is in line for what's known as receiving his father's blessing and the birthright. It's his birthright to receive this blessing and the responsibility for the family. Esau, Isaac favored. He was rough and tough. Love the outdoors, a hunter. But his brother was a Jacob was a mama's boy. Yep. This is the soup he followed his mother. He followed Rebecca all around. Yeah, the soup story. No, it was, was it? I thought it was a stew. It's called the soup story. <laughs> Whatever. So anyway, he has two brothers. I mean, two sons. Esau, the older, Jacob, the younger, by a few minutes. So they are basically the same age as they grow up and everything else. Now, Isaac is old, okay? So he lived a really long life after the little thing with his dad back when he was going to be sacrificed. God favored him with a long life. However, his vision was failing. He had a hard time seeing. In fact... It was so hard that most of the stuff that he did, he did by feel. So, May is now going to share with us what happened. Oh, okay. Okay, I got this. I got this. Go so for it. One day Esau comes home and he's super hungry. And um, he's like, I forgot his name again. Yeah, he asked Jacob, make me a bowl of soup. And Jacob's like, what do you want? What, what can I get in return? I'll give you my birthright. And he gets his birthright. And then when he goes to his father, he wears... Esau, 
Jacob and Esau. Uh, yeah, those two, but I forgot the father's name. Isaac. That's right. Esau trades his. Esau traded his birthright, his inheritance part, for soup for something to eat. And the reason that it he wanted it was because Jacob was a very good cook when it came to making that soup. He liked it. Esau liked the soup. That's why he asked Jacob, "Make me more. It's so good." And Jacob's like, "What's in it for me?" I'll give you the birthright. The Ooh, okay. Now, Rebecca conspired with Jacob because Jacob was basically not a hairy guy, okay? You may have seen, you know, particularly older guys, they shave their chest, stuff like that, because otherwise they'd be all hairy. Some guys don't, and they're hairy. Esau was like the hairy type. He was rugged, outdoors stuff, rough. He was a rough man. So Rebecca comes up with this coat and has Jacob wear it. And it makes Jacob feel like Esau. Now they're the same age, basically. So in terms of feeling other things, you know, it's like they, they feel the same. There's not a lot of difference. They're twins. So Isaac gives his blessing to Jacob. Jacob went out and got married. And who did Jacob get married to? So, how many sons did Jacob have? Was it like 12? Okay. He had 12 sons. Oh, I guess 12. I guess 13. Yes. Question? Yes. Wasn't Jacob, but it was one of the sons. Exactly. And that son who became is the most widely known of the sons. I mean, all of them are because the 12 sons of Jacob have become the 12 tribes of Israel. Each one of them is attributed to one of the tribes of Israel. Benjamin is well known. Jacob, I mean not Jacob, but Joseph is the most well known. Joseph was the favorite. He was the favorite. Favorite. He had this great coat of what they call the coat of multicolors. Yeah. And his brothers were jealous. It was, no, they were jealous of him because he was favored. So there comes this caravan because that's what they used to do. I mean, today we have tankers that, I mean, uh, ships, container ships that park off of shores. Yes. They did what? Put. Yes, they did. That's right. Yes. Yes. So that's what they did, yes. They, they, there are caravans that, go, that used to go back and forth across the desert. They used camels. And they trade. You know, they're bringing rugs and fancy things to one and taking something back. And So the mode of transportation for trade was via camel. Now, they also used ships where water was available, but we're not in an area where there was water. So here comes one of these caravans and they stop at places mostly to water and feed the animals 
we could call them an oasis. They could be towns. Joseph and his brothers had been out, and the brothers conspired. And they ended up putting Joseph in this well. It was dry well, so he didn't drown. And they got hold of an animal, took his cloak that he liked, that multicolored cloak, and they doused it with animal blood. And they went home and told Jacob, Joseph was killed by a wild animal. Exactly. So Joseph ends up going to Egypt as a slave. And we'll start to pick up next week what happened to Joseph. Holy Spirit, amen. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen.